Thanks to the Student Borrower Protection Center for inviting me to speak today about discrimination and income share agreements. It's also great to be with so many who are thinking and wanting to tackle burgeoning student debt. It's been nearly a decade since I got the opportunity to join the team that launched the new Consumer Financial Protection Bureau in the wake of a massive financial crisis. And I got a chance to meet many of you when I served as our agency's first student loan ombudsman. In those early days at the CFPB, we took stock of this growing market. While smaller than the mortgage market, it was one that raised unique concerns. And it had seemed to many of us that some of the federal agencies and regulators in charge of this market were either asleep at the switch, were captured, or were spoon-fed tales about how college always paid off for everyone, and that student debt was basically always worth it, no matter how much you took on. And this was wrong. The Federal Trade Commission, the primary consumer protection regulator of the non-bank lending industry in the for-profit college sector, completely missed the student loan kickback scandal and the job placement misrepresentation epidemic that took off over 15 years ago. The Federal Reserve Board of Governors failed to act to put into place even basic disclosures for families looking to navigate their options on private student loans. And they only did so after a bipartisan Congress and President Bush forced them to do so by law. And year after year, the Department of Education seemed to keep doing the bidding of Sally May and the student loan industry. These federal government failures when it came to student debt were pervasive, and they occurred under both Democrats and Republicans. In those first few years, the CFPB focused on data analysis and action. CFPB conducted groundbreaking research, took major enforcement actions, and started to build in some accountability to the system. We uncovered data that showed that the student loan market was much bigger than previously reported and that millions were defaulting. We worked with state financial regulators, state attorneys general, even military leaders, and many other partners across the country to start repairing the damage, bringing enforcement actions against Wells Fargo, Discover, Corinthian, ITT, and of course, Sally May and Navient. And while our student debt market is still a mess, I think we're better off and more data-driven compared to the bipartisan status quo at the Education Department, the Fed, and even the FTC. One of my guiding principles as a regulator at the CFPB, which continued through my time at the Education Department and now as an FTC commissioner, is to focus on the dangers that come from abuse of market power and abuse of information asymmetry. The student loan market suffered badly on both of these fronts, given the lack of competition and the very few number of responsible players. Schools would steer borrowers to their preferred financial institutions, and those schools reaped big rewards for that. The bank-based student loan program, known as FELL, was supposed to lead to competition based on interest rates and fees, but borrowers were overwhelmingly charged the highest interest rate under federal guidelines through so many years. In the direct loan program, many student borrowers were stuck with a servicer, unable to take their business elsewhere and vote with their feet. Unfortunately, the harms that result from these market structures disproportionately affect those who are racial minorities. And it happens almost every time when it comes to unique issues in financial services. Today, we're examining a specific type of student debt, income share agreements, and the ways to combat potentially discriminatory behavior. First, I want to talk about financial products and how it's important for them to compete on the merits not on regulatory arbitrage. Then I want to briefly discuss why laws like the Equal Credit Opportunity Act apply to income share agreements. 
And finally, I'll share a little bit about how unfairness doctrine might be used to tackle discrimination across markets. When companies compete on price and customer service to market financial products, that can be a boon to everyone. For example, several years ago, the CFPB reported that many Americans took out private student loans when they had little or no credit history. That often meant they got a high interest rate. But once they were earning a decent living, they were stuck with that loan and too often the lousy service that came with it. One positive development that the CFPB played a role in was the availability of new products where borrowers could take out a new private student loan to refinance their old private student loan. And while certainly not without problems, this has saved a lot of people real money when they refinanced out of a high rate private loan into a new one with a much lower rate. But we also see that companies might also try to structure a financial product to sidestep some of the requirements that other providers have to live up to. This regulatory arbitrage is all too common. Companies sometimes rely on a rent-a-bank model to evade interest rate caps. And relevant to today's discussion is when companies pretend that what they are offering is not actually debt or credit. We have seen this in the cash advance industry, which is really a payday loan. In small business, there's a merchant cash advance, which according to one recent state lawsuit, is also a loan. In many ways, these cash advance products share important features with income share agreements, where creditors make claims on future income rather than setting up traditional payment plans. Companies often use these alternative structures to avoid consumer protections and other laws. But when companies develop products and play this game of regulatory arbitrage, that's where families and all the honest businesses in the industry suffer. Families can't easily compare one product to another, and investors start sniffing out that the business model will start attracting bad actors a sign that they should invest their money elsewhere. Five years ago, I testified before the Joint Economic Committee in Congress and argued that we need to make sure that income share agreements can meet the objectives of our core consumer laws, such as those that make sure terms and conditions are clear. I've long been concerned that marketers of income share agreements might claim that their products are a debt-free or interest-free option, and our laws help prevent these types of unsubstantiated claims. Our laws also seek to make sure that borrowers can build a credit history and to protect the rights of military families. And relevant to today's discussion, we cannot have a market that suffers from unlawful discrimination. This brings me to my next point, which is that I believe that income share agreements are covered by credit discrimination laws. The Equal Credit Opportunity Act forbids discrimination in the offering of credit. The law should be primarily enforced by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which also has the authority to issue rules implementing the law. The Department of Justice and the banking regulators also play a role. The FTC also retains ECOA enforcement authority in the non-bank sector. My former colleagues at the CFPB, Joanna Pearl and Brian Shearer, have authored an insightful paper outlining the application of certain consumer financial laws to income share agreements. I agree, especially with their analysis of why ECOA applies to income share agreements. The Equal Credit Opportunity Act and its implementing regulations define credit broadly in ways that are challenging to arbitrage out of. Specifically, the term credit means the right granted by a creditor to a debtor, one, to defer payment of a debt, or two, to incur debts and defer its payment, or three, to purchase property or services and defer payment, therefore. 
Pearl and Shearer rightly highlight case law, finding that deferred payment arrangements, even if they aren't structured like traditional loans, satisfy the statute's definition of credit. For example, courts have found that ECOA covers transactions in the context of an application for cellular telephone service, the provision of propane gas, and a request to purchase electrical service. Just as in those contexts, ISAs allow borrowers to purchase a service, their education, while deferring payment until after they complete it. But this brings me to my final point. Even if income share agreement providers were to create an even more complex structure so that they can dodge accountability under ECOA, discriminatory practices also constitute an unfair practice under the FTC Act and other laws. The FTC Act's prohibition on unfair practices is not limited to credit. States also have many FTC Acts, and many include their own version of unfairness. In an opinion I recently issued in an auto finance discrimination case, I outlined why discrimination meets the test of unfairness in the FTC Act. For the commission to declare an act or practice unfair, it must meet several prongs. Does the practice cause or is it likely to cause substantial injury? Is the act or practice reasonably avoidable by consumers? Discrimination clearly meets these standards as it harms borrowers in ways they cannot avoid and often aren't even aware of. The next part of the inquiry of unfairness requires us to ask whether these harms are outweighed by countervailing benefits to consumers or competition. This is unlikely to be a helpful, to, a helpful defense to those engaging in racially discriminatory practices. In addition, the Commission can also consider other public policy when analyzing an act or practice. Given decades of legislation and other policy initiatives that seek to eliminate discrimination from markets and society writ large, this provides additional support for finding this practice to be unlawful. Using unfairness to tackle discriminatory practices is particularly important given the rise of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and algorithms in modern business decision making, especially online. Unfairness doctrine that broadly covers commercial activity provides an important backstop to our sector-based discrimination laws in employment, housing, credit, and more. This means that ISAs can do all the legal maneuvering in the world to try to ensure their products won't be treated like loans but they still need to ensure they won't be discriminatory. If the FTC encounters discriminatory practices in this space, we can bring lawsuits to halt the violations and return money to borrowers who've been harmed. And states can go further, seeking stiff penalties to ensure that discrimination isn't profitable. Education is supposed to be an equalizer, and that's an important goal. Unfortunately, data reveals that it hasn't been the equalizer we thought it would be. Our student debt market is definitely broken and it needs a massive overhaul. And I'm not sure that new products like income share agreements will be an antidote, especially if they worsen existing disparities. But even as we think broadly about cleaning up the mess that's been made, we need to make sure that borrowers today can avoid discriminatory and unfair practices in the market. However elaborate the financial product, discrimination is discrimination, and regulators need to be vigorous in rooting it out to protect those we've designated uh, as in need of defense and discrimination. I look forward to today's discussion around the fair lending risks around ISAs. You have a terrific panel ahead of you, most of whom I know quite well. 
I want to particularly recognize Nick Smith from the Pennsylvania Attorney General's Office. In my role as commissioner, I try and stay in constant communication with attorneys general and state regulators, who are the leaders today when it comes to policing markets and protecting the public. I know that enforcers and regulators ac across the country will be paying attention to this market. COVID-19 is a stark reminder of the inequities in our country and society. Whether it's our justice system or our education system or our financial system, creating a more fair society and economy must be a higher priority. And that also means rooting out unlawful discrimination from our markets. Thank you, and I look forward to the presentations ahead. So thank you everyone in the audience and thank you to all of our panelists for joining us here today. So last week's opening session dealt with sort of the core concept of income share agreements and the fundamental question of are these credit and can our typical credit reporting laws and credit reporting overseers and credit overseers uh, monitor these effectively. So today's topic, we're gonna delve into the fair lending implications of this new student financing model. So with us today, we have a group of panelists, a combination of lawyers, consumer advocates, and industry participants in various facets who are gonna help us out with what they've seen in the field and what some of the risks they see coming are. So to start us off, we have Stephen Hayes, who with one of his colleagues wrote us our paper on this week's topic. So I'm gonna turn that over to Stephen. Great, thanks Stacey. Can everyone hear me too? Okay, good, good. Well, thank you to the uh, Student Bar Protection Center. I'm Steve Hayes. I work at a firm called Realm and Colfax. We're a plaintiff side civil rights law firm and we specialize in fair lending and for housing cases and we've had cases against um, for profit schools, for example, for predatory lending. We also work with businesses on the front end, um, especially lenders to do fair lending and fair lending testing of their underwriting models, which becomes relevant in a few minutes. Um, I also want to thank Alexa Milton, who works at Realman with me and co-authored this paper. Um, so we approach the student debt crisis as a civil rights crisis. Black students owe significantly more than their white peers in um, student loans. That's against a backdrop of huge wealth, income, ownership, debt disparities. And ISAs have been touted as a solution to this. Some existing structures we've seen, I think, raise cause for concern, and that's what our article is about. I'll talk primarily about ACOA, which is the primary um, federal law that prohibits discrimination in credit, but a lot of other laws actually map on, and we mentioned some of those too in the article. There are two main problems that we talk about um, that we've seen. One is something under a theory called reverse redlining, and the second is disparate impact. I will touch on reverse redlining really quickly because it's important and a problem, but maybe less um, interesting or, or maybe less endemic. So reverse redlining is a theory where there is a predatory product and it is targeted to minority communities. Um, this happens actually not infrequently with particularly complicated financial products. And in the article, we talk about some public reports about um, coding boot camps. And some of these public reports, the allegations mirror what we have seen in other reverse redlining cases. So predatory underlying products, um, confusion about financing it, and then practices that appear directed to minority communities. So happy to talk about that more. I'm going to jump right to the other issue, which is disparate impact. Um, so what disparate impact is, is in a way more benign. It doesn't require intentional discrimination, and it doesn't require a predatory product at all. It's a theory of liability that exists under ACOA and under other anti-discrimination laws. Here what you have is a facially neutral practice that causes an adverse effect on a protected group. So facially neutral means race or protected class, gender is not taken into account um, explicitly, and yet there's still an adverse effect on a group. So you might have a credit model that scores people. It doesn't include race or national origin, but it has an adverse effect on black folks, for example. They get denied more frequently. Um, if that's true, then a defendant has to show that the practice has a legitimate business need. So oftentimes for credit underwriting, that's not that difficult. What the defendant says is we're doing this to predict likely default so that we know who to give credit to or how to price that credit. Um, 
under the disparate impact theory, there can still be liability, even if there is a legitimate interest, if another practice would help accomplish that interest with less discriminatory effect. And so that's the key. I, the way that I think about disparate impact is it's an effort to be continually building a better mousetrap so that we are not unnecessarily excluding protected classes or perpetuating disparities if there's some way to accomplish these business goals without doing that. And this is a lot of the work that my firm does with institutions on the front end. We work with them on their credit models to see if those alternatives exist. For ISAs, um, there are two features that we've seen, which I think likely might fall into this rubric. One is pricing based on school-based distinctions, and the other is um, major-based distinctions. So in other words, you might pay more of your income for a longer amount of time if you are a nursing major rather than an engineering major, for example. Or if you go to a less selective school, you might end up paying more for your ISA than if you went to a more selective school. So that's likely to cause disparities. That How you measure that can get kind of wonky, but actually at base, it's relatively simple. If you are using criteria that reflect historical disparities, you're likely going to be perpetuating those disparities. So I don't think it's a surprise to many people that there are differences in major type. Um, nursing majors are more likely to be women, for example, than engineering majors, that those disparities exist across schools as well. So I think it's likely that you can see by a few metrics, this would perpetuate disparities. The second question is, is there a legitimate business need for this? And I think, I, you know, I don't know, I haven't talked to the lenders who've created these programs, but one idea is likely, look, we have to do some kind of distinctions so that we attract a broad group of people to make the program viable. If the only people we're attracting are likely to make very little income coming out of school, the program's gonna fall apart. We need to be able to attract all kinds of people so we price differently and do that. That might be right. The next question is, do these distinctions actually help get to that goal? And I think these are pretty broad-based distinctions. So school-based distinctions are very broad-based. And in my experience, I think oftentimes might be marginally predictive but there may be other alternatives that would be more predictive. And these, again, are likely to cause disparities. So at the end of the day, I think a statistical analysis of models like this oftentimes reveal surprising sometimes alternatives for how you can do this better, how can you, you can accomplish that goal with less impact. And I will end on that point because it gets pretty wonky quickly, other than to say, if you're a responsible actor that thinks that ISAs will solve some problems for you or for your students, that it's a good alternative for people, I would recommend that you do this type of testing on the front end so that you are not unnecessarily perpetuating these disparities or exacerbating these inequalities. This is something that banks and financial institutions do all the time, and I think it's a worthwhile thing to do. And so I would just leave at that. This type of analysis is possible and, and I think should be, should be done. Great. Thank you, Steve. And I saw a lot of head nodding among the panelists and a couple of head shakes. So we're definitely going to loop back on a number of these points, especially around disparate impact, reverse redlining, and areas like that. So we're going to quickly kind of go through each of the panelists and have each person introduce themselves and also field a kickoff question. So I'm going to throw the first one over to Daniel Rogers, who's the founder of AM Money. And Daniel, I was especially interested in hearing from you on this because you set out with AM Money to build a pretty different kind of student financing product, one that was designed to solve what you saw as some key problems in the market. And I'm interested, when you set out to build this, was an income share agreement an option you considered? And if so, why or why not? Sure, absolutely. Um, can everyone hear me okay? All right, just making sure. So um, certainly I appreciate the question, and I guess it's kind of an upfront Disclosure, of course, I am a market participant. I run a venture capital backed student loan company. And so by no means am I unconflicted in this conversation. But that said, um, as you kind of alluded to, I started the company because of the challenges that I had financing college. And so the short version of the story is that I did my first two years of college while on active duty in the military and then transferred to a four-year institution and still had to beg my grandmother to kind of co-sign on a 12% interest rate loan. And so I have a very personal experience with what it's like to look at a tuition bill and to have to ask yourself hard questions about how you're gonna pay it 
to I certainly have had experience on what it's like to pay back a high interest rate loan and what that means as an individual and like the choices that you can make. And so with that said, I always kind of like to say that for our company, what we're doing is trying to build a company that we wish would have existed in some form or fashion when I was going through college. And what that means to me as an individual is, of course, lower rates, of course, increased access to people who don't have good credit or don't have parents or grandparents, in my case, who are able and willing to co-sign them alone to like ultimately, you know, flexible repayment options on the back end, which is where I think the most overlap between our product and the ISAs kind of exist. And so on one hand, I certainly do believe that that transition from college into career is certainly a very fraught period for people because oftentimes what happens is we say, well, you've just graduated from a good school. You, you must have it all figured out. But I think as we can all attest to on a personal level, that's not exactly the case. And ultimately, the conditions that brought you to an ISA or a student loan in the first place certainly still exist and will, like, will exist for, you know, a in some cases, a pretty significant amount of time, despite the fact that a person might have actually made that next jump up into a certain class. And so I do believe it's really important to have that flexibility. And, and ultimately, like we talk about, you know, defaults of people who are of color. And like, you know, it's a, a stat I posted on Twitter yesterday about how for African American bars who have paid off their student loans, they're twice as likely to have gone into default at some point as compared to their white peers. And for Hispanic bars, that number is even worse. And so certainly there's value there and there's very clearly a need, right? But where ISAs kind of lose me is when it opens up this kind of liability to pay more if it quote unquote things go well. Right. And ultimately for me as an individual, it's very hard to disaggregate myself from it. And if I took the income I actually earned after college and put that into a, you know, pricing model based upon the Purdue program, I would have spent twice as much as I did on a 12% loan. And so as bad as that 12% was, twice as bad is not an improvement in any form or fashion. And, and ultimately, that's obviously a non-starter for me personally. And I would argue it's a non-starter professionally because if I was going around town trying to sell a you know, private loan that was charging 15 to 25%, which is ultimately the cap of the Purdue ISA, no one would look twice at me, nor should they, right? And for me, it just kind of begs the question of, why are we even doing this in the first place? Because like ultimately, you know, uh, I would argue, and I've certainly spent a lot of time working on providing a lot of the protections and a lot of the things that ISA proponents would say are required uh, or like that ISAs are intended to solve while still adhering to consumer regulations for student loans. And so if that's the case, and of course people will argue this point, um, it just kind of begs the question as to why we're opening up this liability and why are we opening up this uh, gray zone in terms of regulations, particularly understanding the history of how that has gone, right? As uh, Steve kind of talked about, you know, banks and other players, we have seen a long history of, you know, financial institutions in general take advantage of certain populations and specifically for college students, right? You know, here in Illinois, there are laws that prevent private student loan companies from advertising on public campuses, right? Um, nationwide, we have laws that prevent credit card companies from, again, going on campuses and targeting college students. Why? Because they've abused it. And ultimately, like those guardrails are critically important because if you don't have them, we're basically relying upon the good faith and the good word of people in the private sector to do the right thing. And history has told us there's no reason to do that in the first place. And so for me, it just kind of comes down to like, I don't believe that there's any trade off that is worth stripping away these hard won protections, which exist in the market. So I'm sorry if that was long, but that's my view on this. No, that was an excellent answer. And you raised the issue that segues greatly well into our next topic, next question, which was around this gray zone that exists in the regulations right now around these. Um, I'm going to switch over to Elisa, Alyssa Gard-Schwartz, who's an attorney who's written on this issue, and I'd love to have you talk a little more about your background with ISAs. Um, and you've written that you think ISAs do need some separate regulation. So I'd like to talk a little more about what the argument for that is, especially around fair lending laws. I'm interested in your take on that, about whether this is an area where ISAs also should have some separate regulation, or if the existing structures are correct for them. 
Yeah, thank you, Stacy. And um, can everybody hear me? Excellent, great. Um, and also thank you so much to the Student Borrower Protection Center. I really appreciate the opportunity to participate in this discussion today. So uh, my name is Alyssa Garden Schwartz. I'm a shareholder at the law firm of Brownstein Hyatt Farber Shrek, um, based in Denver, Colorado. I joined the firm about a year and a half ago. Um, prior to being uh, at Brownstein, I was in the Colorado Attorney General's office for about 12 years. Um, the last four of those years, approximately, I was the Deputy Attorney General for Consumer Protection for Colorado, which meant that I oversaw all of Colorado's enforcement um, around consumer protection and antitrust, um, as well as in Colorado, we license um, non-bank lenders, debt collectors, debt management companies. And so um, I spent a fair amount of time thinking about in the consumer credit context, um, how you balance access to credit with adequate consumer protections. Additionally, our office, uh, while I was there, did a fair amount of activity in the for-profit college space, holding those folks accountable um, for both general consumer protection concerns as well as predatory lending concerns. Um, I come to ISAs more, I mean, really um, mostly uh, with uh, intellectual curiosity, right, uh, given my, my um, past uh, experience with the AG's office and where I am now, I first saw a piece about ISAs in the New York Times. Um, and given my past experience with student loan servicing issues, um, with for-profit college issues, um, I uh, thought the project was interesting and I, I definitely saw it as something where um, folks in state AG offices and at the federal level would start looking at it. Um, because it has features akin to credit. Um, the reason that I've come out in favor of regulating um, ISAs as ISAs and not as um, a loan is, is not, it's more because I think that you get better regulation when you regulate a product um, according to its particular features. And while ISAs may have some features similar to um, private student loans or credit, they also have some significant features that, um, that do not share um, characteristics with those products, right? And so I think um, for it to be effectively regulated and for consumers too to really understand the product, I think it's better to regulate it separately um, according to its particular terms, such as income share percentage caps, maximum payment caps, um, uh, the fact that you have a set period, a set payment period, a set number of payments that you make, such that if you are unemployed or underemployed, there is some back end protection for that. And I think, too, a lot of the um, issues that have already been raised by Dan and by Stephen related to income share agreements and, and potential fair lending concerns can be remedied by stakeholders coming together and coming up with a regulatory framework such that these concerns are, um, are mitigated. And unfortunately, they're not necessarily going to be eliminated because the unfortunate fact of both ISAs as well as loans is that they are um, in, they operate in this space where you have systemic racism vis-a-vis -vis income disparity and opportunity disparity, right? And so I think that to get to your, your central question of whether there needs to be separate regulation in the fair lending space, I don't necessarily think that um, that the structures that have come up through ECOA in terms of evaluating loans I don't think they don't apply to ISAs. I think they need to be, if they are applied to ISAs, I think they have to, again, take into account the particular features of an ISA. That is, are you just looking at pricing and access, but are you also looking at how many borrowers end up paying or how many students end up paying less than um, what was originally extended to them or don't have to pay at all because they sustain periods of unemployment? So, um, you know, I think that that is where I'm coming from in terms of fair lending and looking at potentially different regulation for ISAs. And sorry, that was long. So, oh, it's I'll a good overview. There.
And actually, it's also, again, a good segue to our next panelist, um, Tarak, Tarak Habash from the Student Viral Protection Center. Um, you've pushed back on this idea that ISAs should be regulated separately. So I'm interested in your views on that and also in the experiments with them that we've seen so far. I'm curious about your take on whether the regulators are using the tools that they do have to regulate these and monitoring things appropriately or whether we've already started to see some abuses and things like that slip through on the few dozen ISAs we have out there in the wild right now. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Cool. So I think um, just kind of building on what we've already heard a little bit, I think um, it's really important to be suspicious when you hear an entire industry kind of go out on a limb and paint with a broad brush that, you know, they are completely different from everything on the market and therefore the laws don't apply to them and that, you know, you need to develop a new entire framework for how to regulate those products. I think what we've seen from the ISA industry's playbook has been, you know, we are not credit, we are not debt, we, our products don't accrue interest. Um, and so we're just, we're something else. We need to be regulated differently. And I think kind of uh, just kind of building on what Dan said, like you do need to be suspicious about that. And it's not the first time we've heard this. We've heard this um, in the payday context as well, uh, decades ago. And I think when you're talking about it in the context of consumer financial protection law that has been on the books for decades, designed to protect the most vulnerable consumers, we need to be really, really careful about what we do uh, change from that framework. And so I think um, for the first point, just really quickly, like we, uh, we need to recognize that there is a framework that applies. And I think even Alyssa just kind of pointed to the fact that um, ECOA and the existing laws do apply um, but I think Alyssa's point was that, you know, maybe there is a better way to do it. And I think you can still add additional regulations to better regulate a market to, to some of the specific points um, and features that they have without actually exempting them uh, in the way that the ISA playbook has been in, uh, in Congress and across state houses where we have seen largely ISA legislation being pushed to essentially preempt state licensing laws, state usury caps, uh, to uh, carve it out from carving ISAs out from having to provide the TILA disclosures that apply to credit products. Um, and I think that's a really, really telling point because the things that we are seeing and the things that we are hearing from the industry are essentially saying we these things don't apply to us but also at the same time let's make sure in law that we get it in writing that we have different rules so that we can operate in this like special way that's different from all other consumer financial products and i think um in the in like to your other question stacy um about what regulators are doing in this space i think Unfortunately, we've kind of seen a federal administration, a Trump administration that has decided that, you know, the priority is going to be deregulation for the sake of innovation. And I think um, we've had a CFPB that's been largely silent on this, where in like a different world, I think we have, we would have seen like some uh, interpretation here, some sort of guidance, some sort of oversight and regulation. But I think um, that's not the case in every scenario. I think we're seeing states step up. We're hearing from state regulators um, in California. We're seeing uh, guidance from states like Iowa. And I think like in the context of the FTC and the commissioner uh, providing remarks today, I think there's certainly um, regulators and law enforcement that are looking to step up in this space. Well, speaking of law enforcement, our fourth panelist here with us today, fifth panelist, is Nick Smith from the Pennsylvania Attorney General's Office. And Nick heads the Bureau of Consumer Protection there. So Nick, I'd love to have you introduce yourself. And also, one of the questions I have on this is, we've started to see some experiments with this pop up in your own state. And I'm curious about whether your office is already hearing from consumers and borrowers with questions or concerns about these products, or if at this point, it's still so early stage that that's more of a hypothetical risk than a real one for you guys fielding those incoming questions and complaints. So, Nick, 
Sure. Thanks, Stacy, and um, thanks to SBPC for having me. Um, I run our Consumer Financial Protection Unit in Pennsylvania, and so under me is all of our cases having to do with student debt and all types of financial products and lending from banks and non-banks. Um, so we are definitely interested in ISAs. Um, I'd say at this point it is more of a hypothetical because there are only a few schools that are offering ISAs in Pennsylvania and they only started offering them two years ago. So um, I think there have not been enough students yet who've come through programs, graduated, and then are all of a sudden paying huge amounts of money or you know defaulting and, and uh, coming to us with problems. But we're certainly concerned about them. Um, you know, I, I think that the papers were, are great. The one that uh, Stephen wrote and the one from last week, uh, you know, these are, these are clearly credit products, um, whether you come out with a new form of regulation or, or you fit them in under the existing uh, regulations. Um, you know, they, throughout the industry, uh, the consumer finance industry, businesses constantly want to argue that they're not covered that they're, um, you know, they're, they're special, they're different, that the law shouldn't apply to them. We hear this all the time and, and um, you know, they hire expensive lawyers to try to convince us that they're right. Um, and, and this is no different. I think um, one of the really interesting things I'd like to talk about on this panel is the potential hidden interest that's at play here. Um, Stephen, on page 14 of your paper, you talk about uh, schools that offer ISA as being much more expensive than traditional boot camps. And so that struck me as, well, wait a second, um, not only are these products potentially very expensive in terms of the interest you're paying, but if the cash price is inflated um, beca because people are paying with this form of credit, maybe then that's additional hidden interest under TILA. Um, so I'd love to talk more about that, but, um, but that's my, my intro. That's actually a good segue to a point I wanted to hone in on, which is that we've sort of seen these being used in two different ways right now. We've seen some traditional four-year type colleges experimenting with these. And then we've also seen a lot of like coding boot camps and things that look a lot more like the for-profit colleges that we've always had issues with over the last couple of decades. So one thing I'm curious about is, you know, is this an inherent, a product with inherent risk or is it a product that's risks are magnified by the types of operators that are choosing to offer it? Anyone wanting to take a crack at that first, or I will otherwise nominate someone to dive in on it. I, Alyssa, I did I see your? It strikes me as as one where there is uh, it's magnifying the underlying risk. Um, so the another product that came to mind is some it's something called military allotments, which uh, Seth Frotman and I worked very hard to to limit um, when we were at the CFDB, and essentially they were a way where service members could pay directly from their paycheck. Um, and it made creditors much more willing to extend extremely expensive loans, charging very inflated cash prices for things like jewelry and cars. Um, and they knew that they were going to get paid and they were just taking advantage of young enlisted service members who had a paycheck for the first time in their lives and, and didn't really understand like what was good value in terms of shopping. And I think in the for-profit school space, you have a lot of this similar dynamics in play where folks maybe don't understand what's a fair price. Um, and the, the way an ISA works is it, it gives you this, this sort of false sense of security where you think, well, gee, if I can't get a job or if I'm making low pay, then I'm protected. I'm not gonna actually have to pay that much. Um, so it, I think it makes it harder psychologically to, um, to shop carefully and really say to yourself, okay, like I'm taking on $50,000 in debt because you've got this sort of release clause as it were. Um, but I'd, I'd love to know what the psychologists and the economists think of them too. Oh, you're on mute. Oh, was that something anyone else wanted to jump in? I look like Alyssa, it looked like you had some thoughts there. Yeah, I mean, a couple things. I think that, um, again, I mean, I, I go back to my point of, um, I, I don't think that ISAs are um, inherently discriminatory. I think that, um, and, and to, to go to Nick's point, I mean, I think that, I mean, I'm not sure, and I'm not here to defend any particular ISA model, but I think that 
Um, there are, in fact, ISAs out there where, you know, you if you are underemployed or you're unemployed, you don't make payments. There's no extension on the payment terms or the um, number of payments. And you end up paying, um, you may not even necessarily pay the amount originally extended. You may pay less or you may pay nothing at all. And I think if it's a concern that that's not what certain ISA providers are doing, again, I think that goes back to that's a guardrail that you put up in regulation specific to ISAs. So, I mean, I agree that you don't want these products being um, marketed through sleight of hand to vulnerable communities, certainly. And I think the way that you get around that is by um, putting in regulation that is, again, you have all stakeholders coming together to determine what that looks like so that you are ensured that consumers are well informed about what they're taking on if they go with this particular product as opposed to a traditional private loan, um, which as I think we all agree, like private loans have not fared well in communities of color. Um, that's something that uh, definitely needs <laughs> some work, right? And so I think what we have here is an opportunity where you're not underwriting based on, you know, uh, FICO scores, which um, are, I mean, I think in 2016, the NCLC came out with a report on how credit scores um, and their use disproportionately negatively impact communities of color. And so instead with ISAs, we're talking about an entirely different way about thinking of pricing, which is looking at, you know, potential, which is looking at, you know, future earnings. And, you know, we can talk about the finer points of how you price based on looking at that, but there's still the underlying advantage of we're, we're taking a step toward doing something different because it's been clear that what we've been doing in the past has not been benefiting uh, minorities or women. And I'm interested, there's the issue with ISAs both of who's taking them out and as you said about the pricing model of how the product itself is structured. And one of the most intriguing and potentially problematic aspects of them is that a lot of schools are basing their ISAs on things like your major. So a person who's an engineering major is potentially going to have different looking payment terms than someone who's like an English major. And that seems to go right to the heart of the issue we're talking about today about fair lending and impacts that might not be immediately obvious about how that's going to disproportionately affect different communities. So I'm especially interested to hear, um, I think Daniel, you mentioned in the emails that you had some thoughts on that particular issue. So I'd love to maybe start with you and then hear others as well on this. Yeah. So. <laughs> A few things, I guess. Um, I guess I would say, like, first of all, the fact that the private market itself does not do right by students or borrowers is not a reason to exempt people from the laws that were put in place to protect borrowers because of those abuses. And ultimately, that's, to me, a not great argument because ultimately you're open like like you're reopening the conversation around whether or not people can take advantage of a population and how do you do so and this conversation around major i think in particular and even more broadly around isas and that question of potential is just fraught for abuse because ultimately what we're doing is asking students to make a very informed decision on a future outcome that they probably are unequipped to do so, do not have complete information, which is a, like as a UChicago alum, a requisite for a functioning market, right? And like as Rohit talked about in his video, is inclined to abuse of information asymmetry, right? And ultimately, right, like uh, in the example of Purdue is a perfect example and the research that has come out from um, like, like, uh, like, like this group has kind of shown that the incomes that they tell people that they can expect is actually dramatically less than what the data says they can expect. And I've been on a panel with those people and, and, and brought this up and the response was, well, you have to account for things like death of the student, where my response to that is that like if Purdue itself is having a massive outbreak of their students dying a few years after graduation, that's a di different conversation we should be having, right? And that certainly is not appropriate into a pricing model where when you take that data, 
ultimately ends up with certain people who are paying nine to 10% additional interest based upon historical data, right? And so certainly like there's an argument and I do this that you can use this potential argument to increase access and to bring down the cost of debt. And I'm fully on board for that, right? But I would again ask the question of why do we need to open up this additional liability in doing so, right? Because if we believe that data and if we have an understanding of this risk that allows us to make a certain argument, why then does it follow that you have to charge them additional money for doing so? Excellent point. And Alyssa, I think I saw your hand up on this as well. Yeah, I mean, a couple things. I mean, I think that, you know, one, I want to be clear. I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't feel, um, and the folks that um, are ISA's providers, ISA providers, proponents, investors, none of the folks that I've talked to are coming from the position that they should be above the law or exempt from the law. I think the position they're coming from is let's put laws into place so that the people who are, are offering these products and want to do so in a fair and equitable manner have a clear path as to how to do that. So, I mean, I, I wanna make that point first. And then I think on the second point in terms of pricing um, along the lines of major, you know, I mean, there is, we can have a discussion about, you know, we look at the Purdue model and my understanding of what, how they've done their pricing is ultimately to get to the place where a, a, you know, a social work major and an engineering major are making the same payments, which is similar to a loan, right? I mean, that's, you know, no matter what your major is, you're paying the same tuition. And if you're getting a federal loan, you're making the same loan payments. So that was the intent. It may be, that that has um, uh, an, in, an unintended consequence or uh, an impact that is not desirable. This is a new financial product. If that's the case, let's, you know, let's continue that testing. Let's go back to the drawing board and see if there is a way to adjust the pricing so that it's more equitable, so that you have potentially more cross subsidization between the folks that are making more money as a result of their field of study versus the folks that are, are making less. So again, I think this is, um, you know, I think the discussion is really important. And I think it's also really important to remember that it's a new product and that we have the opportunity to shape it in such a manner so that it is a, a good viable alternate product for folks um, that need additional financing beyond federal loans. And Tarek, I saw your hand up as well to jump in on this. Yeah, I just wanna just plug really quickly on one thing that Alyssa said and then kind of build on some of the, the differential pricing stuff. But Alyssa, you had mentioned that, um, that ISAs uh, and their proponents aren't advocating not for exemptions from the law, just that they're asking for regulations to uh, to like be a little bit more specific to their products, but the ones I've spoken with, yeah, yes. the ones you've spoken with. The problem with that is that there are there is a framework of laws that already exist, and from what I've seen, I'm not seeing the TILA disclosures in the contracts that ISA providers are issuing to students. I'm not seeing them comply with the existing framework of laws, and so despite their arguments that, you know, the, that they're not asking for carve out, they're also not complying with the existing laws. And I think that's a problem. Um, so just like, just quickly on that, but then um, just circling back to the question about the differential pricing. And then I think Stephen wants to, uh, to also weigh in here, which I think um, would be useful. Um, just uh, coming back to the question about whether um, like differential pricing is like a concern here and whether it causes um, unintended consequences. I think um, whether or not we're thinking about this as underlying risk or inherent risk, I think uh, really depends on the details of the terms that we're seeing for students. I think we can all agree no ISA is um, uniform. Every ISA contract is a little bit different, and especially if we're factoring in different terms based on major, 
um, those things matter. But what we're seeing when we look at the numbers are concerning. Um, and I think what we are seeing when you have one company, one service provider that is working with multiple schools and providing different terms based on those schools, based on how accessible each school is, based on potentially the demographics, whether that is an actual input in the algorithm that they're determining pricing models or whether, um, whether those demographics are just um, an unintended consequence uh, for how pricing is different between schools. We're seeing different impact uh, and different costs for students and that does create harm and I think that's a really really big concern and uh, with respect to whether it's um, an intended risk or not I think really depends on those details and what's being factored in. Stephen I'd love to get your take on this and also in your research on this for the paper I'm interested in some of the real world examples that you came across of cases where you saw ISAs that are out there operating now that raise some of these concerns. Sure. Um, so on the differential pricing issue, I think one important thing to keep in mind is to separate some of these anti-discrimination laws from some of the other credit specific laws, because I can, I'm sort of sympathetic actually, like there are some specific credit laws about disclosures that would have to be modified in some way because this is a different product. And so I think frankly, they're all covered now. But it can be confusing in terms of how these things map on. That's always been a perennial problem because a lot of these consumer laws are very prescriptive. And so it maps on now, could it be improved so that consumers understand it better? Yes. Um, in the anti-discrimination space, actually the principles I talked about, reverse redlining and disparate impact, basically operate the same across a huge range of markets. So they operate the same in, especially disparate impact in employment, in housing, in renting, in land use, in credit. I mean, it's a very flexible doctrine. So the idea that you need a new doctrine here, I think is probably wrong. Um, what I will say though, is that one of the benefits of it being flexible is that in my experience, actually disparate impact has encouraged a lot of innovation. So risk-based pricing is hard and underwriting is hard. And, um, and as Alyssa said, like the counterfactual that we currently have now in student loans and in other loans is quite bad if you're a minority. Like FICO, in my view, causes a lot of disparities. It's not a great system, right? And we have lots of loan products that are just like that. But what disparate impact does is it encourages people to constantly be thinking about, can we improve on this model to decrease those disparities? So in my mind, that's really important. Whether it is a COA that applies, which it should, or some other specific disparate impact law that you wanna to write to this product, like it will operate the same, it should, and it should be encouraging this, this type of innovation. And I would say too, I believe probably that schools like Purdue believe that this is good for students. Like they are there to operate on behalf of students. I take them at their word that they generally want to do this in a way that improves the lives of students. If they're serious about that, they should be doing this disparate impact testing and pressure testing this to make sure it's not exacerbating disparities and that it is predictive constantly to make sure that they're satisfying like the goals that they are purporting to have. And so. That's not a question of exempting. I mean, frankly, the proposals on ACOA have been from Young and Warner, just exempt this from ACOA entirely with no proposal to say, and here's the anti-discrimination framework that would apply. Like, that sounds quite bad to me. But regardless of what the law applies, if you're a provider here, pressure test it. And again, a lot of responsible lenders are constantly doing this because they want to do right by their consumers. So I think that's an important point to make. Yeah, you just perfectly teed up a question which I was hoping to get everyone to weigh in on, which is that the only reason we're even considering ISAs is because there's sort of this broad acknowledgement that the existing student financing model, lots of debt, is bad. We need alternatives. So given that there is interest in experimenting with these things, what are the things that the early people should be doing to sort of put safeguards around here? What's the best practices for doing this correctly? And I think you just raised one, which is do that disparate impact testing. Look at the results of what you've set loose in the world. So I'd like to hear from some of the panelists about what your thoughts are on what else we should be doing as we start experimenting with these things in the wild to try to mitigate these fair lending issues. Anyone wanting to tackle that first? I see Dan, Dan's hand up. Sure, absolutely. So uh, ultimately, like, again, I'm very much on the side of innovation. Like our company spends a lot of time 
doing exactly what Steve is talking about to understand our models, to understand the impact it would have and things of that nature. And like, I guess like one thing I'll kind of bring up in terms of Alyssa's remarks to kind of frame this conversation is this notion that some people might pay more than others, right? And that's a part of this process, particularly as it pertains to ISAs. And I'll just kind of bring up the question of who determines that, right? Like what's acceptable or not, right? And ultimately, um, like, I think the challenge of exemption is that we take the frame of that away from the current frame that we currently have, right? Like our product gets scrutiny because we charge between five and 7%, which for student loans is, you know, on the higher end of the spectrum um, for the public market, but certainly on the lower end for the private market, as we should, right? Um, but also, right, like, I mean, to the extent the person can pay 15, 20, 25%, we're talking a whole different ballgame, right? And so that question of who determines like who pays more, who doesn't is a very perilous question in my opinion. And you have to be careful about it. And the reason why you have to be careful is because ultimately, you know, when we talk about data, right? People often take outcome data from institutions and use that as the kind of gospel for what's going on. And in my opinion or my experience of analyzing this data, what people are missing is that oftentimes those outcomes are actually a, a function of the like like inputs into the model right and and in the paper that steve wrote i really appreciated the comparison between u chicago and uic i live four blocks from u chicago we work a lot with uic and so like like i have these like, like numbers and i'm ready you know and a part of what's going on right is that like like the data very clearly shows that outcomes for students from u chicago uh, particularly as measured by salary are greater than people who go to UIC, but we're not talking about the same thing because ultimately U Chicago only has a very small percentage of lower, more at risk students, right? And like, I think the last time I checked, it's, it's around 600 or so Pell eligible students, which if you do it as a percentage of their endowment is not great versus UIC, which has approximately 11,000 students on the Pell Grant, right? And of the rest of the, like, and that represents an access of 60% of their student population, right? And if you look at the rest of the 40%, certainly it's not the, like the offshoots of people who end up at U Chicago. So ultimately when you're evaluating these things, right? You have to ask yourself the question of, am I measuring outcomes or outputs or am I measuring the inputs into the model? And in that contrast of UIC and U Chicago, what you're doing is measuring the actual inputs. And what that does is creates a scenario in which the rich are getting richer, right? And the poor are getting poorer, despite whatever it is they're actually doing, right? Because at that point, it does not come down to what the student has done, right? And the anecdote of a past paper of Seth's group that kind of showed, you know, like a, a person who graduated from Howard that went to a certain platform and who was similarly situated as a person from Columbia ended up paying more, right? That's the microcosm of what's happening there, right? Because like, like what you're doing in that case is measuring the input of Howard versus the input of Columbia versus the outcome, which is exactly the same thing, right? And so that's certainly where you have to be very careful in terms of how you approach this. And that question is certainly why it gives me an extreme amount of pause for ISAs, because if you do not answer that question, in my experience, what always happens is people like me suffer. And Alyssa, I saw you were also thinking on this. I'd love to hear sort of what, you're, what you've heard in your discussion with clients and things like that about the best practices about going about this sort of thing and what people wanting to offer ISAs can do here. Yeah, and um, a couple things. I mean, first, I think a best practice, and it's something that, I, you know, I definitely advise clients, is um, engaging early and often with this group, right? Because I think that, um, I think there needs to be, um, and maybe I'm an eternal optimist, like I continue to believe even in today's world that people who are coming from different positions can come together um, on an ultimate goal of how do we, you know, we're not going to be able to solve the student debt crisis with a new financial product, certainly, but how do we come together and think about in the context of this product, which bakes in, you know, income-based repayment, which has um, a protection for students that have difficulty gaining um, employment, which, 
you know, my, my big take or my, what I keep saying about ISAs coming from having done enforcement against for-profit colleges is one thing I like is that it has the potential to hold those for-profit colleges accountable for actually getting students the jobs they say they can get for students, right? And provided that they're not using an ISA to meet their 90-10 obligations and, you know, there are, you know, obviously other factors. But I think a best practice really is to have this discussion and look at ISAs as a tool in our toolbox and not necessarily something that is inherently bad or inherently spectacular, right? I mean, I think, um, and I think another best practice that I've seen, there are some programs out there um, such as what Colorado Mountain College does um, in their ISA, which, is, which they put into place to help DACA students who don't have access to Title IV funding. Um, there is LEAF, who's a, a big ISA provider. They just announced a partnership with Opportunity Hub to develop an ISA program for a coding boot camp at Morehouse, right? I think, again, you know, I think it's good to have sort of expansive thinking in how it is that we can use this tool to actually help communities that have not been well served by current lending models and current financial products. And Nick, I'd like to throw a question your way. We've talked a lot about the regulation on this, and right now it's sort of the Wild West. People are experimenting with things, and it's kind of up to every regulator to decide if they're going to take action on it or not. Is this an area, this sort of edges into next week's topic, but I'd still like to tackle it now. Is this an area where you'd like to see the federal government, like the CFPB, the Department of Education, those sorts of groups, take more of a leadership role and start putting out some guidance and things like that? Or is this an area where you think it's better for the states to take the lead on it? Um, I definitely think the federal government should take the lead. Uh, I don't think they will with the current leadership, but um, you know, maybe next year there will be new people in the Department of Education and CFPB, and they can start an initiative um, to think about this. Because what I was going to say, uh, I, that we, you asked what industry participants should be doing now, I think what we really need is intensive testing of marketing and disclosure materials. Um, I'm sure many of the companies themselves do their own uh, A-B testing on emails and you know, there's probably extensive records that um, various government agencies can subpoena and look through. But um, the, the work that needs to be done to really make a good disclosure regime takes years. And uh, the CFPB, you know, did it recently with the, the combined TILA RESPA disclosures in the mortgage market. There are these outside firms that you hire to do the testing and refining the forms. And so I think that would be something that the industry could get started on now um, is trying to come up with good standardized disclosures and then they could just hand that over to the CFPB if the CFPB decides to take it um, but that's that's one thing that would be really helpful and of course tying it back to today's topic um, you'd want the testing to look specifically at how different groups uh, and different different people from different backgrounds perceive the marketing materials and the disclosures because it's not gonna do you any good if the U Chicago students fully understand what they're getting themselves into, but the students that are going to, you know, the online coding school just don't get it. Um, you need to really make these things uh, clear and, and, um, and remember that, you know, the audience member is someone who's not been to college, 17 years old or older in the case of for-profit schools, many people mid-career. Um, so it's really, you know, it's really difficult to explain these concepts in a way that people can understand. But that's why I think there needs to be a, a, a big push to do rigorous testing of marketing disclosures. And by the way, I would add as a last point that sometimes products are so complicated that there is no way you can properly explain them. And that's when they need to be banned, right? So you think about the um, yield spread premiums on mortgages, the way that brokers were paid in the lead up to the financial crisis. The Fed tried for years to develop disclosures that explained to consumers, hey, your broker is gonna make more money for putting you into a worse loan. Your broker has a huge incentive to put you in a worse loan. And they tried and tried and tried and they couldn't do it. They found that it was just too, too hard. Consumers thought when they saw this disclosure, it made them trust their broker more. 
because the broker was like, hey, I, I'm not working for you. I'm working for my own interests. And the people were like, wow, he sounds really trustworthy. Um, so some products are just too complicated and too dangerous and need to be banned. I'm not saying that's definitely the case here with ISAs, but you're probably going to need some strong substantive guardrails in place, just as we have in the mortgage market with like the prohibition on prepayment penalties, for example. And, and um, that's all stuff the CFPB definitely needs to do. Uh, states can do it in the meantime, but uh, you know, there's, I don't have a fantasy that, that we states are going to be able to carry the water on this because it's just too complicated and, and there are too many states that w would have no interest in actually doing good work and they would just let the industry write the regulations. You raise an important point about the complexity of this. One thing that struck me in writing about these and interviewing schools and students about them is that to some degree, among the traditional schools especially, there's been less interest in them than they expected because it's a complicated product and because students sit down and try to figure it out and go, I can't ballpark what things are going to look like in five years, just give me the traditional thing alone. So I'm interested, I mean, obviously, higher education is going to go through some very major changes this year in the wake of everything going on with the pandemic and all of that. What's, this is a little beyond our official topic scope, but I'm really interested in the group's views on this about what's the outlook you see for this going forward? Like, is what's going on right now likely to increase the use of these kinds of products or decrease it? Daniel, it looks like you had thoughts and ready to jump in on that or? Yeah, so I, like, I am always deeply uncomfortable with the notion that we'll experiment on students who don't have a ton of choices because ultimately what we know kind of to your question is that people need to go to college to have an outside shot at like, you know, getting into the middle and upper classes, right? Like I saw a panel yesterday in which a person called uh, a student loan is, is, is not a part of a toolbox, but as like the key, you know, to something, right? And ultimately what we know um, in our experience is that the need which existed pre-COVID is only gonna go up from here in terms of the vast majority of students rely upon working part-time if not full-time like myself to pay for college um, or their parents who are increasingly at risk because of the types of jobs that they have won't be able to support at the same level they could have otherwise to you know the broad strokes like fundamental macro issue that's causing this problem in the disinvestment of higher education from states is increasingly going to be at risk as like state revenues are going to plummet and funding as it looks now is not going to kind of keep pace with what's going on. So ultimately I see the problem that everyone is trying to solve for getting worse, which only makes it that much more critical that whatever it is we do, right? Like we don't have an approach which puts the onus on the students to navigate these very complex things on the top of everything else that they're doing and absolves the organizations from the responsibility of doing the right thing, right? Because like ultimately, right, like, and I'm glad you brought up the notion of incentives, right? Because then the inherent incentive is to lowball the potential outcome that a person might have, you know, like what happens if you can't find a job? What happens if you're underemployed? And then use that as a mechanism to then, you know, quote them a, a, like a lower potential income, but still charge them a higher rate on the back end based upon the data that you have, which is precisely what we're seeing happening at Purdue and other places, right? And the incentive of the product is structured in a way that is conducive to that type of abuse. And we have to be very, very careful about that. I saw a couple of hands go up on this one. Tarek, I'd like to get your thoughts and then we'll go on to the next. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think one of the things that we need to do is also investigate what we're actually seeing from, from schools, from industry during this like really trying time. And, you know, what we found is that ISAs are being promoted as a solution for schools to be able to help bridge the gap for enrollment when students are struggling to figure out how to make ends meet. We're seeing new ISA programs cropping up in the middle of a pandemic, we're seeing schools, traditional schools even, expand their ISA offerings from a couple majors to all of uh, their uh, offerings because it is a response to the pandemic. Um, but what we're not actually seeing are terms that are more generous to students. If anything, what we're seeing is 
a concern from industry that there isn't enough investment interest because of depressed uh, workforce, because people don't really know what is going to happen to these new graduates and whether they're going to be able to repay those ISAs. And I suspect that what that means at a macro level for the years to come is that terms are not going to be more student friendly, but actually more investor friendly, because that's the only way that you get more incentive for people to invest. And I think in the context that we've been kind of talking about all of this stuff um, around like regulation and um, laws and the applicability of the existing legal framework is whether this is the right time to also create a new framework for a special new product that industry touts as something entirely different. And I think that's really, really concerning. And Stephen, I saw you were nodding along on this and then all. Yeah, I just wanted to make the point that early on, Stacey, you distinguished the types of coding boot camps from the Purdue's and Utah's of the world. And we haven't, we spent more time, I think, talking about the Purdue's and Utah's, which is important. Uh, I, and I don't know, frankly, if organizations like that will, there'll be more ISAs or not. I am fairly confident that um, there will be more of the type of coding boot camp predatory lending, reverse redlining type practices, because those tend, like clockwork, they arise across a ton of different contexts when there is um, lightened regulation, when it seems like enforcement is not very likely, or the rules are sort of changed to allow these things to blossom, and when there's a recession. And so you have a lot of people who feel very vulnerable, they're out of work, they need options, and frankly, like it's sort of easy to take advantage of them. And we have both of those happening right now. And that's one of the things that troubles me about this push for not treating these as though they're credit, not treating them as though they're regulated by these laws. That's exactly the environment where we've seen predatory for-profit schools come into play. We've seen predatory mortgage products come into play historically. And I will say too, that there's a bit of a fine line. Like oftentimes these will be marketed to the populations that don't have any other choices. And the marketing will be, look, we're serving this population who's not otherwise being served. And that can be laudable if the product that you're offering is actually a good product, but it is so easy to have it slip and then essentially be a predatory product. Um, and again, this was like, we have had many, many reverse redlining cases, almost uniformly in them. They will say, we're doing a social good. We're offering this product to people who can't otherwise get served. And all the cases we bring uniformly, they're predatory products designed to exploit these people. And so that's my worry right now, we have conditions that are very ripe for that type of coding boot camp or whatever the next iteration that ISA would facilitate. And the complication of them makes it very easy to take advantage of people because it's hard to understand what's happening here. And Alyssa, I know you were wanting to jump in on this as well. Yeah, thanks, Stacey. So a couple of things. I mean, I take a little bit of issue with the idea that, um, that ISAs are inherently a very complex product. I think any financial product is going to have some level of complexity. I think loans are a complex product. You know, when you start talking to students about APR and how to, you know, sort of game out, you know, what your, the interest rate and what that looks like for payments. I mean, that's, that's not a, um, a simple exercise by any means. And I think that ISAs are, you know, their, their basic principles are fairly straightforward. You know, obviously there's, you know, there are nuances within those. But again, I think this goes back to, you know, let's think about how we can use this product so that it is, um, it's clearly explained to consumers what it is. On the, the piece of, uh, you know, concerns about ISAs coming up um, as a result of COVID, I mean, I go back to what I said before, I also um, am, concerned about, you know, when I see recession, having litigated um, a case uh, against a for-profit college here that clearly took advantage of the recession and um, marketed to vulnerable students and communities and gave them degrees that got them nowhere. Um, you know, I see this again as, is there a way that we can use ISAs to make those schools accountable for if they're marketing it to students and saying, 
you know what, there's a downturn in the economy. This is a, this is a great time to get your, you know, CNA certificate or get your um, ultrasound tech certificate. And then you're going to be employable when you get out. You know, if there's a way to use an ISA saying, okay, well, you can make those promises to students, but the only way you're actually going to get paid is if you make good on those promises and you are, you invest in your career services such that folks are getting those jobs when they get out. So, I mean, I think, you know, again, I, you know, I think we have to be measured in how we think about this product from both sides, but I think there is potential there. Um, and I think that's something that we have to think about um, along with the, the, the you know, risks that, that folks have voiced concerns about. And I know we're getting close on time. Uh, I have one other thing I wanted to throw out there to the group to get thoughts on, as well as any closing thoughts on anything we haven't covered, which is that this is an area so far where clearly the industry's been leading and the regulators and law enforcement officials are following behind and kind of trying to keep an eye on how things are going. Going forward, especially around fair lending, is this an area where you think the ground rules for how ISAs are going to be allowed to operate in this space are largely going to be set through regulation or through litigation? And anyone wanting to dive in on that one first? I'll, I'll listen. Sorry, I just, um, so my, my hope is that it's through regulation because I know from experience in overseeing an, an enforcement office that regulation through enforcement is not um, efficient, right? I mean, it's, you really wanna save your resources for um, folks that are, are bad actors that are, um, and, and you have, you know, especially I know AG offices in particular are dealing with a lot of um, consumer protection issues in the wake of COVID. And so um, I do think, although, you know, regulation, it takes effort, it takes dialogue, um, it takes work in the political process. I think, you know, that would be the ideal way for um, there to be um, guardrails around ISAs. And Dan, I saw your hand up on this as well. Oh, um, sorry. Yeah, like, so I'm not a lawyer, so I don't really have a strong opinion on like how it happens. I just know that ultimately it has to happen. And, um, you know, we certainly have to ask ourselves, how hard is it going to be to put the genie back in the bottle if we open it back up? And Tarek, I saw you also. Yeah, I mean, I think it needs to be both. I think, unfortunately, one thing that we've seen is that nearly every ISA contract includes a pretty aggressive uh, mandatory arbitration clause, making it impossible for private litigation uh, to really move forward and for us to be able to get information about, you know, what the, the final determination of that private arbitration looks like. So uh, if there is um, litigation, it's going to be it's going to likely need to be on the public side. And so um, certainly I think like there's room for, um, for states and federal regulators to really step up here. But I think there's also an ongoing conversation about how to enforce existing laws and how to ensure that those, uh, those providers are operating within um, the existing framework. Um, and so figuring out how you, uh, really do that, figuring out whether new regulations need to be created is an ongoing conversation, but it does not uh, substitute for the fact that there is a framework that already exists and um, compliance is necessary. And Nick, I'd love to jump in and get your, your final thoughts on this issue and then come over to Stephen to close us out. Sure, I think it'll be both. Um, I mean, I'd love to see the regulatory apparatus up and running and, and working on uh, how you apply TILA and ECOA to ISAs, but realistically that's not going to happen anytime soon. And even if a new CFPB director made it a priority on day one, it would take three years probably to do a rule. Um, so I think you're going to see some enforcement actions in the meantime and maybe some class actions, but as Tarek said, class actions are hard, so it'll be left to the enforcers to um, police this space in the meantime. Thanks. And over to Stephen. I agree with all of that. Private litigation here, because of the complications, especially with arbitration agreements, 
is really difficult, um, even in cases that feel like low hanging fruit on the facts. I don't think that means it can't be done. We have almost every case that I can think of that are big cases at the outset. Generally, it seems like this cannot be done and then somehow you figure out a way to do it. On the disparate impact piece for models, this last piece about how do you risk price, do you use major or not, those are really, really hard cases for any private litigant. A disparate impact case based on models because you need so much information that's only in the possession of the lender. And so again, I would say, would love to see some regulation in this space, would love to see some supervision to get a sense of what's actually happening. And again, I would encourage any entity that wants to do right by its students and thinks it's actually solving problems to do it itself um, without being told to before a regulator comes and sues it. Start pressure testing what you're doing because if you believe in it, that's what you should be doing. And people do that now, not in the ISA space that I know of, but they should transfer it over. Well, thank you so much to everyone, to our panelists for their time this afternoon and for putting on your fancy Zoom shirts and everything. And thank you to the audience as well for being with us through all of our occasional technical challenges. I'm going to kick things back over to Seth Rotman to wrap us up. Thank you, thank you so much, Stacey. And I wanted to thank our panelists and moderator for a fantastic conversation, uh, Commissioner Chopra for his opening remarks, and all of you who tuned in for today's event. Uh, a recording of today's event will be available here on emergingrisks.org, and I encourage anyone who hasn't to check out Stephen Hayes and Alexa Milton's paper that examines fair lending and discrimination risk around ISAs. And just a reminder that next Thursday at 2 p.m., we will be having the final installment of our Emerging Risk series, where our panel will explore the role that state consumer law plays with respect to ISAs and the ability of state regulators and attorneys general to protect students from the risk posed by these products. Uh, I wanted to note that we received some notes about difficulties with the streaming of uh, Commissioner Chopra's video. So we're going to rerun that right now for those who want to stay uh, tuned in and listen if you are unable to before. But uh, thank you again to all the participants and viewers, and we look forward to seeing you all next week.